I've been speaking about the new covenant. <clears throat> We've talked about the new agreement is so important for us to understand. For those of us who have grabbed a hold of it, it has literally changed our lives. We're talking about people who've grown up as Christians all our lives. Not when we understood the new agreement, but when we chose to live radically by the new agreement and let nothing stop us to take the new agreement at its word and obey it, it has literally changed my life. It can change yours too. It is available to everyone. The reason is not because it's not available to us. It's because we don't have the courage to obey it implicitly. We make excuses for it. We look at the Christian world around us. We find something or the other to fall short, and that's when stagnation comes in. The new agreement, no new news for everybody, is that we must be like Jesus. Exactly like Jesus. In that he never sinned. Never. 10,000 hours, 10,000 days, never sinned even once. We have to be like Jesus. We've heard about this, heard this many times, but don't we all need a refresher every week to tell us what our goal is, what the destination of our GPS is? You've got to be like Jesus who never sinned even once for 10,000 days. How are you doing, brother? How are you doing, sister? That's the goal. I don't care what your GPS thinks you think you want to do it. That's what you've set. That's what, if you're a Christian, that's what the Bible tells you is your GPS. 290,000 hours, never sinning even once. That's Jesus. And the new agreement is that you sign, that we sign with God is, I want to be like Jesus. Never gets old. It never stops being convicting. And the new agreement is not that thou shalt. That's the old agreement. Thou shall not commit murder. Thou shall not steal. Thou shall not commit adultery. The new agreement is God saying, I will do it. I will write your law, my laws in your heart. I will put my precepts on your minds. I will do it. It's what God told Abraham. I will give you a son through your wife, Abraham, who's dead, whose womb is dead. I will do it. The work we have to have is to have faith. That's what we have to have is faith. Faith is to say, Amen. That's the word that Abraham said in Hebrews chapter 15. Abraham said, Amen. That's the word for believe. Abraham said, Amen. It will be so. And he said it for 25 years before he had the son. That's our example. That God will do it. That he will make me like Jesus, who never sinned. I must do my part. And God gives me these two wonderful virtues, these wonderful um, gifts to arm us as we come to the starting line. That's what we've talked about. Grace, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's grace. God gives it to us so that we can say as we start the Christian life, I'm the richest person in the universe. When God dumps all of his spiritual blessings on me in Christ, then I receive him. How can I not be the richest person in the universe? Because my eyes have not been opened to see how valuable God's riches are. And he asks, tells us that we are justified. When we come to the starting line, we say, Lord Jesus, Jesus is telling me, Lord Sandeep, you stand here before me just as if you've never sinned because you stand in Christ. And I looked at Christ and I saw someone who never sinned. And I looked at someone who always obeyed, and that's how I look at you. Many of our problems, many of our problems is because we've not even read the preface of the new agreement. That's just the preface. 
God wants me to be like Jesus. God will do it. God wants you to say amen to it. God looks at you as if you've never sinned when you scum in Christ. And God says, start living this day as if you're the richest person in the universe. Because I've given you the pearl of great price. So what are you discouraged about again? Why are you in a bad mood again? Why are you grumbling again? Let's go back to the starting line. Let's go to the very beginning and see where what we've missed. That's why it's easy to understand how God would say, do all things without grumbling and complaining. Be anxious for nothing. Rejoice always in the Lord. Why? Well, do you know you've been justified? Do you know what justified means? Do you know that you've got grace over you? God's riches at Christ's expense? Do you know you have all of that? Why are you coming to me with a sad face? Why are you so downcast? Old agreement people could have it, but not you. Were you literally bound for hell? Was the executioner's sword being sharpened? Was the electric chair being readied for you? Was that what happened? Was that where you were? Bound for hell and then Lord, the Lord Jesus came and saved you? Transferred you into the kingdom of light? That's what we all say at the very beginning of what it means to be a Christian. This is the new agreement. And there's a small little passage that Jesus talks about the new agreement in Luke chapter 5. <clears throat> Luke chapter 5, in verse 33 to 39. This was a found, foundational message that I heard from my dad that really shone a light, a huge floodlight into my life in my time many years ago it was one of those pivotal passages that to me really transformed so much in Luke, Luke chapter 5 verse 33 the disciples of John the Pharisees were saying the disciples of John fast and offer prayers the disciples of the Pharisees do the same but you your disciples Jesus just eat and drink and he says well that's because they've got the bridegroom here in verse 34 and 35 but when the bridegroom is taken away they too will fast and then he goes on to explain a very little parable which describes the difference between the disciples of John and the worldview of John or the discipleship program of John, the discipleship program of the Pharisees and all of the old agreement. We read in Matthew chapter 11 or 12 that John the Baptist was the greatest of all the old covenant people. So under the old agreement, Jesus was saying, John's the best you can get. And you see the John, disciples of John were doing different things. And Jesus says, I'm different. I'm so dramatically different. You've got to understand this. And he goes on to talk about a parable. And he says in verse 36, no one tears a piece from a new agreement or new garment and puts it on an old garment. Otherwise, he will both tear the new and the piece from the new will not match the old. Verse 37, and no one puts new wine into old wine skins, otherwise the new wine will burst the skins and it will be spilled out and the skins will be ruined. But new wine must be put into new fresh wine skins. And no one after drinking old wine wishes for new, for he says, the old is good enough. And the new agreement is new wine in new wineskins. Many Christians think that the new agreement is new wine. It isn't. And many Christians try to put new wine into old wineskins and it bursts. And let me explain to you as I've understood it, as I've, been, as, as I've been taught. It's not some brand new revelation I've gotten. The new wine and the new wineskins. The new wine is the life of Jesus. The new wine is the life of Jesus. What is the life of Jesus? Some of us may think that the life of Jesus means to be sinless. Some of us think that life of Jesus is to go around performing miracles and healing the sick and raising the dead. Hopefully, those of us who have been part of this church know that that's not the life of Jesus. That's the ministry of Jesus. And God gives different ministries to different people. All, all the disciples of Jesus didn't have that same ministry as Jesus. Jesus walked on water. Not all the disciples walked on water. The life 
of Jesus. Though we may go past that and say the life of Jesus is to not sin. Yes, the life of Jesus does include not sinning. That's central to the life of Jesus. But it is not just sinning, not, not the absence of sinning. Do you know that the planets are sinless? Have the planets ever disobeyed God? Planets are sinless. The angels who didn't disobey God, have they ever sinned? Do you know where they stand? They stand and see the face of their our Father. So the Bible says, angels have never sinned. It's not the life of Jesus. So if we are pursuing just the absence of sin, we're in for a rude surprise. Because the absence of sin is not the life of Jesus. We must pursue the absence of sin. It says in Luke, Hebrews 4.15 that Jesus was tempted in all points and was yet without sin while on this earth. So that's clearly one of the characteristics of his life, that he never sinned. But the purity of Jesus is more than just the absence of sin. Cleaning up the cup, a dirty cup, and I can have a completely clean cup but it's not going to satisfy my thirst. It's just clean and empty. What we need is the life of Jesus. We need the water, the eternal water of the life of Jesus to be also poured in. So as much as we in this church stress that we must fight all sin, even after we fight all sin and keep our cups completely clean, now we are still an empty, clean cup. And I must see the great emptiness of an empty cup in my life. After I've done what? After I have obeyed all the commandments. Jesus says, don't do this, don't do that, don't do that, don't lust with your eyes. Don't get angry, overcome evil with good. Lord, am I just an empty cup? I'm an empty cup if you don't fill me with the life of Jesus. This is shown so beautifully in the story of how Jesus turned water into wine in John chapter 2. You can turn there if you want, but most of you may know the story of where Jesus turns water into wine after the wine, the old wine has run out. Right? We can maybe turn there to John chapter 2 verse 3. When the regular wine what the people make, the best wine. If you think about a wedding and you think about a fancy wedding, you think about how people will say, let's select the best wine. This is a celebration. This is the best wine that humans could select. That's what was selected for a wedding. It wasn't just on an ordinary dinner. This was a wedding. They selected the best wine and then the old wine, this wine, which is now old, runs out. And they come to Jesus and they say, they have, he has, they say they have no wine. The old wine has run out. Life under the old agreement, life by trying to live the law, it's run out. What does Jesus do? Do you think, now we know the story. If you know the story, what Jesus did is he took the water pots, he filled them with water, and then he says he turned the water into wine. Do you think it was very difficult for Jesus, who did such a thing, to change water into wine, to automatically fill the water pots with wine directly? Do you think it was very difficult for Jesus to just have the water pots magically transported so that it could be right there for the servers to take? How did Jesus do it? And that's a lesson for us on how Jesus changed water into wine. The miracle is that Jesus changed water into wine, but how Jesus did it is so critically important. What does he tell them to do? In verse 6, Jesus had, this says that there were six stone water pots containing 20 to 30 gallons. So that's about 120 to 150 gallons of water pots that the water, the water pots could hold of water. And Jesus said something very simply in verse 7, fill the water pots with 150 gallons of water. They didn't have a hose. They didn't have a tap. They didn't have these automatic hydraulic systems that could fill it. They had pitchers. And these servants, says in verse 7, a small little, they didn't even get their own verse. 
you would think the people who were putting scripture would have read this verse and said, that's a pretty big deal to fill 150 pots of water and they didn't have a tap. Maybe let's give them their own verse. They didn't even do that. They, these servants just got half a verse. They filled them up to the brim. 150 gallons full of water. This is an example of what we must do to obey God. As we are running the race, as we walk this race, as we run this race armed with grace and being justified, knowing that in Christ God looks at us as if we've never sinned and considers us the richest people in the universe. As we walk this race, God says, fill up 150 pots of gallons of pots with water. And it's hard and it's laborious, as you know. Fighting lust of the eyes, it's, it's hard. Fighting getting angry, forgiving others who have hurt you, living with no bitterness, rejoicing always, being anxious for nothing. These are not trivial things. It's like filling 150 gallons of water in water pots. Jesus says, go and fill them. And that's what he asks us to do, to obey his commands. His command is simple, fill the water pots with water. And we've given, we've gotten a lot of commands over here in this Bible. We know a lot of them. God says, go and obey it now. Obey it. What did the servants do? I don't need some big testimony to come and tell you how I fill all the water pots with water. I just fill the water pots with water. 150 gallons. When they had filled it to the brim, then Jesus says, take it to the waiter. Now I have a question to you. After the servants had filled all the water pots, water pots with water, what was in the water pots? It's a very important question for us to ask ourselves. After the servants filled all the water pots with water, what was in the water pots? You, you're raising your hand? You want to tell me? What is it? Water. What was in the water pot was water. After we do everything to obey the commands of God, what is in the water pot? Water. What do I have in my heart? Water. Not fit to serve a marriage. Not fit for the wedding. Not fit to be used for God's purposes. After I have completely obeyed still don't have the life of Jesus. Some of us are going with empty water pots and saying, God, I don't have the life of Jesus. Please give me wine. And God says, I'm not going to give you wine. I'm going to tell you, go fill the water pots with water. Take up your cross every day, deny yourself and follow me. So when that girl comes indecently dressed, us men, take up our cross. Flee temptation. Flee youthful lusts. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. Run to it. And when the anxiety or love of money, God says, fill the water pots with water. Flee. Hate the love of money. Hate all forms of greed. The love of money is the root of all evil. There's so many verses like that. God says, fill the water pots with water. So in your situation, whether it's unforgiveness, whether it's bitterness, whether it's envy, whether it is lust, whether it is anger, whether it is something else, love of money, fill the water pots with water. I don't need a new word. Command is crystal clear. Take up your cross. Deny yourself and put your self-life to death. Well, I did it for half a water pot. Keep doing it. I told you 150 gallons. Lord Jesus, I waited three days for the feelings to change. The feelings hasn't changed. Lord Jesus, I told you one week. I gave you one week to take me out of the desert. The desert's still here. Lord, I gave you three months to change this issue. It hasn't changed. My boss is getting better and better. He just got promoted. It's going to get even harder for me. 
fill the water pots with water. This is where most of us who are servants claim to be servants of Jesus Christ lose our way. But that was not my point with the whole with the whole new wine. After doing doing this, and I believe that some of us who've been coming to our church for years have been starting to do this, have been starting to fill the water pots with water faithfully. But after we fill the water pots with water and we start to control our tongue, and we don't, are not shouting at our wives or our husbands like we used to. We're not getting angry like we used to. We're not lusting with our eyes like we used to. Now we can get fooled into thinking that these filled water pots are fit to be served at the wedding. And that is the worst of all deceptions. <laughs> it's the deception that the disciples of the Pharisees and the Pharisees fell into. Thinking that their righteousness, their obedience to the law, that's the old agreement's law, was meaningful. God says, I want loyalty. I don't want sacrifices. Fill the water pots, fill the water pots. Sit down, sit down. Stand up, stand up. 150 gallons, 150 gallons. Take up your cross every day, take up my cross every day. Do all things without grumbling, all things without grumbling. Be anxious for nothing, nothing will make me anxious. Filling water pots with water, dear brothers and sisters. Holy Spirit has been given to us as a helper. We still got to do it. But then after that, we must go to Jesus and say, Jesus, this is the wine. This is the water. It's the best I got. I filled 150 gallons of water. Here I go, Lord Jesus. Any of us who have tried to obey all of the commands know that this is extremely difficult. We know how deceptive our flesh is, how much we love to take glory in ourselves and in our good works. This is where true humility lies, to do this after we have obeyed all the commands. Christendom is full of people who are trying to encourage sinners to be humble. I encourage sinners to depart from their evil ways. We encourage sinners to depart from their evil ways and take up their cross and follow Jesus. We encourage those who are taking up their cross and obeying all the commands to truly be humble. To recognize that all of their obedience has just put in them water pots that are filled with water. Extreme big difference between the sinners who have empty water pots and us who have water pots filled with water. There's a dramatic difference. Because we can go to the Lord and the Lord will answer our prayers. Sinners, God says, first obey me. Fill the water pots with water. Now I'll do the real miracle, the life of Jesus. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4 says, Through his promises we get to partake of the divine nature. Immense words for us to meditate on. I haven't even scratched the surface of that verse. To partake of the divine nature. We are so discouraged when we see our sinful nature. Is it possible, dear Lord Jesus, that you will give me the chance to partake of your nature that hates sin, hate, 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 that tongue that speaks a nasty word, that I that lusts, I want to hate it. Divine nature, that's what I need. Turn my eyes, flee from youthful lusts. Lord Jesus, I can do that. But divine nature that hates it. I got water, Lord. I need you to turn it into wine. That loves righteousness, not does righteousness. The nature that loves righteousness with all of my heart. Lord Jesus, I need your wine. This is the life of Jesus. Sounds un unbelievable that it can happen in our lives. Any more unbelievable than a 90-year-old having a baby? Sarah? Any more unbelievable than a virgin birthing the Christ? 
something that we all believe. It's the new agreement. God wants to give us the new wine. He wants to do it. He has signed it in his son's blood. And he says, now you just need to countersign it. All the promises of God are yes in Christ. And we affix our amen. We countersign it. Not by saying, I'm going to do it now. No, Lord, it will be so. This is the new wine. The new wine of Jesus was that. I was thinking about this as Bobby was saying. What was the pearl of great price for Jesus? <coughs> what was the pearl of price for Jesus? That he was willing to never do his own will. That's the story of Jesus' life. I never did my own will. Never once. What was the motivation for him to never do his own will? I see that in John chapter 5, verse 18 through 20. John chapter 5, verse 18 through 20, it says... The Jews were seeking to kill Jesus all the more because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was calling God his own father. And Jesus said, truly, the son can do nothing of himself. Here's this verse that I said, Jesus did nothing, never did his own will. He says, son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the father doing. For whatever the father does, these things the son also does. The son does nothing on his own initiative. He never does his own will. That's John 6, 38 too. We know that. I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. But why, Lord Jesus, do you take such a drastic sense to never do your own will? To never do anything on your own initiative? Why? Well, it tells me that in the very next verse, in verse 20. Because, you know why I never do my own will? Because the father loves me. That's why. That is the pearl of great price. The love of the Father. Shown in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The love of God. That is the motivation for which, for why we never do our own will. So do you, are you struggling to give up your own will? Are you struggling to lay everything on the altar? It's not because you're not good enough. It's not because you're not so spiritual. It's because you don't know how much the Father loves you. You don't know how much you have a Heavenly Father. And the Heavenly Father loves you. That's the reason. So the truly spiritual person is not a spiritual person who does all the right deeds. Because such a person could be doing it on his own merit. But a truly spiritual person like Jesus is one who knows how much the Father loves him. How much the Father loves her. Because of that, they never do their own will. Show me someone who says, I know the Father loves me. Such a person will not be doing their own will. Such a person will be becoming more increasingly holy. As the Bible describes holiness. They have to be. Because that's what happens when we know the Father's love. We have all kinds of distortions and counterfeits to the Father's love, which has been reduced to feelings and experiences. And we say, I know the Father's love. Absolutely not. It's rubbish. Here's Jesus is saying, you know, I'll never do my, I never do my own will because the Father loves me. Does the Father love you? And we won't ever do our own will. We will be so surrendered to Him that we find that even... Full surrender is a response. It's not some big dramatic act I have to do. It's a response to what God did for me. This is the life of Jesus that we need to have. To know the love of God. This is the pearl of great price that we must have. But as I we heard too, this... It's like, I love that analogy of the stamp collector. This small, trivial piece of paper is so meaningless to the vast majority of people, but it is 
so dramatically valuable to a stamp collector? Are we, but our eyes need to be open to it. And my eyes need to be open then to the life of Jesus. That what the world and most of the world considers trivial, just a small, another book written by man, just another good man who lived. God needs to open my eyes to see what the stamp collector sees in that so precious small piece of paper. This is not a small piece of paper. The Lord needs to open my eyes to see that about Jesus in a very personal way. Not, not open my mind here, the open the eyes of my heart to where I'm so convinced. Can you imagine Noah spending 100 years or so building the ark? How he looked like a fool to everybody on this earth. But his eyes had been opened to something that was going to happen. Our eyes need to be equally dramatically opened. There's something that's going to happen. That Jesus is going to come back for a bride. Then our priorities will just change automatically. We will be free from anxiety more and more because we have a father. We heard that passage from Matthew chapter 6. Be anxious for nothing. Why? Because you have a father. See how the Father dresses this and that, dresses this and that? That's why. If you don't have a Father, yeah, of course you should be worried. But if you have a Heavenly Father, no reason to be worried. And I want to end also with the, the, it's just a thought to leave you with. The new agreement is not just new wine. The new agreement is new wine in new wineskins. And the old wineskin was what the old agreement was contained in. So the old covenant law was contained in the Mosaic law and the tabernacle and the temple and the rituals of the Sabbath and how you fasted and what you ate and what you didn't eat and what money you gave and how the different sacrifices worked and tithing and all of these things that is in the old wineskin. Now Jesus says, I don't come like the disciples of John. John comes. I don't come as the Pharisees come and tell my disciples to do this. I've come with a new wineskin. And so much of Christendom, so much of Christendom have been fooled because they're trying to put new wine, the life of Jesus, into old wineskins. So they read something in Leviticus or Malachi and say, you must tithe. Old wineskin. They read the Psalms and they read something else about how worship was with music and they say, worship is music. They've not read the new agreement. And so most of us just, okay, well, there's a verse. It's the Bible. says it. Must be true. Without ever reading, that, without ever being taught, is this old agreement or is this new agreement? How many of us think eating pork is in the new agreement? How many of us think tithing is in the new agreement? How many of us think worship has got anything to do with music in the in the new agreement. Most of us have been fooled in some of these areas, I tell you that. Let's have a time of worship. You know what you're gonna, all going to expect? Most of us are going to expect, some of us are going to expect. Okay, where's the music leader? He's going to come up now. He's going to bring his guitar, he's going to bring his thing, he's going to sing a song. Worship in the new agreement has nothing to do with music. But you, Christendom is constantly trying to put new wine Jesus, grace, faith, the death of Jesus will have communion in the old, old wineskins. And we wonder why this church thing doesn't work. We wonder why our Christian life is consistently empty. Because we've got religion. 
We don't have new wine and new wineskins. And sure enough, look what's happening. Old wineskins are bursting all over the place. I'm not here to criticize anybody. We are not here to criticize anybody. But I am absolutely convinced that the Lord has a new wineskin for the new wine that does not burst. God said it in his word and we are experiencing it in our daily lives. A new wineskin where we strictly follow the principles of the new agreement. Some people say, oh, yeah, look, I'm not interested in wineskins at all. I just have new wine. I just have the life of Jesus. They're also being absolutely unbiblical. They say, oh, we'll just sit at home. We'll just listen to good sermons. We'll just have the new life. I just need the wine of Jesus. It's all about the life of Christ, right? It's all about having the life of Christ. We distort God's word. God said, put new wine in new wineskins. So dear brother, dear sister, where's your wineskins that you're putting your wine in? It's not just your body. That's the first wineskin. The second wineskin is the church. That's it. There are only two wineskins that we put the life of Jesus into. Our lives and through that, of course, our family lives and the church. That's it. And if we're not putting the new wine into proper new wineskins, our new wineskins, and the new wine will burst. It'll spill out and it'll cause a mess, as we see in Christendom today. It's so important that we look at new wine and say, Lord, am I having the new wine? Am I putting this new wine in a new wineskin? And there are many things that are different, and we'll spend many weeks thinking about the new wineskin and ways in which it's different. The Levitical system is gone. We've talked about no longer needing to have a clergy. There is no special level for priests or pastors. Or oh, I need a word from God. Pastor, please help me. Tell me what is God's word. Folks have not understand the new agreement, understood the new agreement. You've got direct access to your dad in heaven. Have you asked him? There's a place for us to ask godly counsel, but have we not seen the new agreement and sought the Lord and say, Lord, I have access to you? But also recognizing that there is an imperative, there's a need, a necessity to have the church. So I'm going to make the church a priority. I'm going to make the people of God a priority, the people I'm committed to. And there are many different wineskins in the Bay Area. This is not the only wineskin. So we're absolutely clear about that. Many different wineskins. The Lord is doing his own work there. And it's up to the Lord to take care of those wineskins. But this wineskin, this particular wineskin, this is our responsibility. When I say our, I don't mean the elders. I mean our, every single person who said, I want to be committed to this group. It is our responsibility to pray for it, to tend to it. To make sure that the wineskin doesn't become old wineskin. That we're not finding a little tear and then finding an old agreement word to stitch and fill the gap. Where we're consistent to say, Lord Jesus, we want the new agreement. I started this series on the new agreement because I felt that many folks in our church, who are committed to our church, who are part of New Covenant Christian Fellowship and didn't understand the new agreement as they should. And I didn't understand it if I had not been taught. And I learned this, a lot, a lot of these things from my dad and the teachings in CFC. And it has blessed my heart tremendously. And about seven years ago, I taught this, a lot of the things that I'm speaking here in a class at another church. And that's where I met Jeremy and his wife. And I, Bobby was there too. And that was some critical seeds that were planted. In fact, my dad even Skyped in for one of the classes because he was talking about the body of Christ as being an imperative of the new agreement. I said, I can't speak to that. I've done nothing about it. I want it, but I can't show you how to do it because I've not done it. So let's get somebody who's done it to speak to you. So in that class, in this other church, I Skyped in my father because I said, I'm not going to talk to you about things I've not done. I can tell you about knowing God as a father because I've experienced that. But I can't tell you about the body of Christ because I'm not doing anything about it. I want to. For what I have meeting in my home is not the new agreement, the definition of the church. I'm still hoping I'll find it. 
Praise God that the Lord was able to touch them and many other people to know the truths that we are now enjoying and learning more about. But since then, many folks have come who are new. And so, though they may have been blessed by some of the teachings or different things, it's very important for us to have a good grasp on the new agreement. The life of Jesus and the vessel in which the new wine must be held, the life of Jesus must be held, which is the church. That's why Israel is just a piece of land to us. It's not the Holy Land. The Holy Land is my body. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The church is the temple of God. You won't find us in this church marketing trips to Israel. Why? Because it's a piece of land. Old agreement is festering in the Christian church. Especially in the area of money. We heard from Matthew chapter 6. You cannot love God and money. But the moment money comes in because I have to pay for this building or because you have to pay for my salary because I need it, I'll start teaching all kinds of theories on how God needs your, God needs your money and so you need to give it to this church. And money is why you need to go to Israel. Because the organizers of the Israel trips get a free trip. So they'll tell you how great it is to go to Israel and see where Jesus walked. They won't tell you that they get the free trip. If you get 15 people to go, any travel agent will give me a free trip. Ways in which money comes in and deceives people. Because we don't study the new agreement. I'm so thankful that I had a teacher who had to study this and learn this from the people who went before him and God showed him things that we've been blessed to sit under his teachings and be blessed by. The proof of it is not in a name. The proof of it is in our lives. We have seen that the life that we are experiencing is something worth running after. Dear brothers and sisters who are part of this church, that's my primary burden. I pray that the Lord will give you a hunger to seek, to look through all the practices in your life and look for the new wine, but also look for the new wineskins. May God help us. <clears throat> Just want to add a hearty amen to that, to what we heard. And um, yes, absolutely. And also agree, my life's been changed. And is continuing to be changed. It's not just that I'm not a finished product, but it's, I remember, I'll, t I'll say one thing about that class. I remember many things from that class um, were transformative for me. One thing Sandeep said, which I'll never forget, you know, that was what, 2010? Yeah, seven and a half years ago, it was January, February of 2010. And one thing he said, which when I heard it, I couldn't, fa it was uh, simultaneously, I could not fathom it, I didn't believe it, and I had to have it. All three things at the same time. And it was this. He said, um, I used to think about my Christian life as it's like a, you know airplane. It takes off, and then you reach a cruising altitude. And he said, at some point, what the Lord did was, he showed me, I don't know if this, I'm, I'm going to botch your illustration, but he said, he showed me that there's a jetpack in my seat. And when I realized that, I've never been at the same altitude since. And when I heard that, I thought, that's impossible. And if it's possible, I have to have it. And um, I thank God, by His grace, I can, I can say I've experienced that as well. It's never been the same. And uh, that's our hope for every single person here. And, you know, there's, I was just looking at the passage that Sandy was mentioning in Luke 5. In the last verse, he says, he says, no one after drinking old wine wishes for new, for he says, the old's good enough. And I think that's a really important thing for us. That's why we have to take the difference between the old wine and the new wine, between the old wine skin and the new wine skin so seriously. Because no one after drinking old wishes for new. You want to know the quickest way to kill your thirst for the life of Jesus and for the new wine skin is to be satisfied with the old. It's the easiest way to kill your thirst. And so it's really important, all these things. I mean, I was just thinking about the examples that Sandy mentioned. It's amazing. We all scoff at pork. 
None of us think it's wrong to eat pork, right? But then when you start talking about money, wait, what do you mean about yeah, uh, Christian work, being tithe, you know, tithing. Hang on, hang on, hang on. No, we'd scoff. If we talked about, you know, having phylacteries, we would all laugh. Or if we talked about that men have to, you know, have certain, you know, hairstyles or women have to have certain, we'd say, no, no, that's old covenant. But then you start talking about questioning whether the Sabbath is a new covenant practice. You go, whoa, that's precious. Don't mess with my Sabbath, right? And there's all of these things, you know, I'm being lighthearted to make a point. There are all of these areas in which old covenant practices sneak in. And unless we are crystal clear, we will say, just like Jesus warns here, the old's good enough. And that's the danger. And I thank God from the bottom of my heart that he brought me in touch with Sandeep and he brought me in touch with Brother Zach. My family's forever changed. Uh, and I can't thank him enough. It says... One of the new covenant promises in the Old Testament is, I will give them shepherds after my own heart. And to me, there's this sense in, the, in modern Christianity that everybody's a shepherd. Quick, you, you got converted? Quick, get into the fields, be a shepherd. And one thing that I've been transformed by is to say, no, it's good to be a sheep. We don't all have to be shepherds. God knows I have no desire to, be, I, I'm not an elder in this church because I was seeking some office, not at all. And the reason I stayed here, you know, we, our family, we almost had to move to Texas. The reason we stayed here is not because of an opportunity to shepherd, not the least. It was an opportunity to be a sheep, to be, we said, we see a man after God's heart. This is, this is what I've always longed for. And that is, that should be our, the most precious prized possession. You know, rejoice not that the demons are subject to you, but that your names are recorded in heaven. We can rejoice in all of the authority. That's what Jesus says in Luke 10. We can rejoice in all of our authority over evil. We can rejoice in all this ministry, all the service we can do. And the word of the Lord Jesus to us is rejoice that your names are recorded in heaven. Re rejoice that you're a sheep. And if you have found a shepherd after God's own heart, rejoice. And if you haven't, if you haven't here, by all means, find somewhere that you can truly say, this is a shepherd after God's heart. This person is not interested in my money. They're not interested in my opinion. They're not interested in getting any honor from me. Nothing, nothing less will do. Because if, you sat, if, you, if you're willing to accept something less, what Jesus says here in Luke 5, 39 is true. Complacency. The old's good enough. I'm happy just carving out one day a week for the Lord. Six days are mine. Happy carving out 10% for the Lord. 90% is mine. I'm happy on and on and on and on and on. And we don't want that. We want, we want and as we heard about worship, right? We know the new covenant definition of worship is in Romans 12. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. This is your spiritual service of worship. And we want to be satisfied with nothing, nothing less here than that spiritual service. I also wanted to emphasize something Cindy mentioned, if you want to turn to Ephesians 3, the importance of the church. We heard about the new wine being the life of Jesus and the life of Jesus doing the Father's will, never doing his own will and doing the Father's will because he always saw that the Father loved him. The Father was always loving him. And we heard about the new wineskin being the church. And I love this verse in Ephesians 3, where it brings the two together. If I want the life of Jesus Christ, the assurance of God's love, I must have the church. It says here, if you look, verse 17, Ephesians 3, 17, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, and so that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints... What is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge. And I've experienced that. I cannot know the length and breadth and height and depth of the love of Christ by myself. I have to come to know it with all the saints. And I've seen in my own life, I couldn't come into a true knowledge and assurance of the, lo of the love of Jesus Christ because I wasn't coming into the knowledge with all the saints. And I've experienced as I come into that knowledge with all the saints, I find that, you know, like Paul says in Romans 8, we overwhelmingly conquer because we're convinced that nothing will separate us from the love of God. And I need the church. 
for that to be fulfilled to the extent that God desires for it to be fulfilled. And I have to treasure the new wineskin every bit as much as I treasure the new wine of the life of Jesus Christ. Last thing I'll say as we uh, pray together is in Romans 4, it talks about Abraham. Sandeep mentioned Abraham. And it mentions how he conducted himself in faith. And I wanted to point our attention, just as we think about experiencing all that we've heard today and the longing that we have in our hearts for this to be a reality, and increasingly so, from one degree of glory to the next. If you look at Romans 4, 9, verse 19, it says, Without becoming weak in faith, he contemplated his own body, now as good as dead, since he was about 100 years old, in the deadness of Sarah's womb, yet with respect to the promise of God, he did not waver, but grew strong in faith. And that's... I want that to be my testimony too. Without becoming weak in faith, he considered his own body. He considered all this water. That's what we heard this morning. That after all that I've done, I just have a pot full of water. But is that discouraging? What we see from the from the example that Paul gives us here, the Holy Spirit gives us in Romans 4 is without become, becoming weak in faith. He considered this pot of water that he had worked so diligently to fill. And then upon seeing its water, he gave up. She got discouraged. She said, what's the use? No, she did not waver in unbelief, but grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully assured that what God had promised, he was also to, able to perform. And that's our testimony too. As we see, all, the we, all of our obedience, all of our taking up our cross, all of that, we're just filling the spot. It's just water that we're not discouraged because it's God's desire to produce the life of Jesus Christ in us. And he will do it. We are absolutely convinced and we want to continue in that assurance. So as we pray together, that was my heart for this time of prayer. As we pray together today, let's pray and let this first be true of us. No matter what we've seen of our own flesh, the deadness of our own womb, so to speak, let it be true of us without becoming weak in faith. They gave glory to God and were fully assured that what he had promised he would perform.